Welcome to the December edition of The Coffee House, where in the next hour, folk rock legend Richie Havens was not at Woodstock 99, but he sure was at Woodstock 69, and he's here with us, too. Radio talk show host Diane Rehm discusses her new memoir, and Doug Gansler looks back on his first year as Montgomery County State's Attorney. Also, pesticides on golf courses. Do green greens mean ungreen upkeep practices? Hey, a global documentary film festival is coming to Silver Spring. Pat Alfterheide reviews the film Snow Falling on Cedars, and Miriam Morsel Nathan offers her poem, The Absurd Messiah. Hi, and welcome to the Coffee House. He's 37 years old, a Chevy Chase native, the product of a hoity-toity education, Sidwell Friends High School, undergraduate degree from Yale, law degree from the University of Virginia. He clerked for a justice of Maryland's highest court, worked for a blue-chip private law firm, then served as a line prosecutor at the prestigious U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C. Last year, Doug Gansler run, ran for Montgomery County State's Attorney. He campaigned on a program calling for community prosecution, and he won. Within a few days of taking office, Doug Gansler went mano a mano with Mike Tyson in a courtroom, not a boxing ring. Soon thereafter, he pressed a high decibel attack against Israeli justice officials for refusing to extradite Samuel Scheinbein. Scheinbein later confessed to one of the most gruesome murders ever committed in Montgomery County or anywhere. We'll talk with Doug Gansler about these cases and others, what's happening with community prosecution in the county, and other matters. Welcome to the Coffee House. Doug, you took office in January uh, and were almost immediately in the glare of the cameras and lights. Uh, Mike Tyson earlier had been arrested uh, for assault on two motorists in Montgomery County. Uh, your predecessor, uh, Bob Dean, had agreed on the basis of a no contest plea by Mike Tyson uh, to grant probation. Uh, and you, at that point, uh, didn't challenge that because you didn't have the legal foundation to challenge, but you did suggest that that was a bad idea very publicly, and the judge sentenced Mike Tyson to jail. Uh, did you do that in order to send a message of what kind of prosecutor you were going to be? No. In fact, I, that was actually my first surprise. Bob Dean never did sign anything saying there would be no jail, and that was the defense lawyer's ploy to, to get out there. Sports Illustrated later said when they looked at the plea agreement and they looked at our sentencing memorandum, that was a lie, a publicity stunt, or both. Um, but we did seek um, to have some sort of a jail time to hold Mr. Tyson accountable. This is a man who was on probation for rape at the time, who literally gave a haymaker to a 62-year-old man in the middle of the road, knocked him down, got back in his car, kicked a 50-year-old man in the groin like he was drop kicking a football, got back in his car after being restrained by his own security guard, and then left the scene. Uh, the average person for you or me, and we had his criminal record, we would have gotten four to seven years. He got a year. I thought that was a fair uh, sentence. I thought, um, I, I think that the idea here is to But he didn't serve a year. He, he did not serve a year, but that's the way we don't have truth in sentencing in Maryland, and we, and we should. Um, but he got an appropriate sentence, and I think that my mantra has always been do the right thing, have a reason for doing the right thing, and you won't get in trouble. And I think that that case uh, showed that we were trying to do the right thing, and I think we did. Uh, soon thereafter, uh, Samuel Scheinbein case. Uh, here is a guy who uh, strangles uh, Alfredo Teo with a rope to death, then chops him up in little bits with an electric saw, burns him, uh, and stuffs the ashes in garbage bags, and flees to Israel, and claims citizenship on the basis of his father's citizenship there. Uh, you seek extradition, uh, don't get cooperation from Israeli justice officials, uh, and you get uh, involved in a, a pretty uh, high decibel um, uh, contest with these folks. Uh, but in fact, uh, he got to stay in Israel, confessed to the murder, and got a sentence of 24 years chance for probation in what, 13? 14 years. 14 years. It's a, it was a torturous and long type of case from the legal standpoint. Um, 
in fact, the Israeli government was always with us. They agreed that Sam Scheinman should be extradited from the, the inception of the case. It was the Israeli judicial system, which I have the utmost respect for, but that got this decision plain wrong. And Sam Scheinman's father was not an Israeli citizen. He was born before is there, before Israel was even a country, and left before citizenship was conferred. Sam Scheinman was born here, lived here, went to school here, never had been to Israel. And Israel is not, was not set up for criminals to seek safe harbor there. In fact, the law has subsequently been changed as a result of the Scheinbein case. And uh, we have our warrant out for him. And so he's basically exiled from the United States forever. He'll serve 16 years in jail over there. And that, while that's a severe sentence in the lenses of the Israeli system, he would have by statute received a life sentence here, possibly life without parole sentence here. So obviously it's an unsatisfactory result. Let's talk a little bit about the case of Bob Alvarez and Kitty Tucker. Uh, these are folks who live in Tacoma Park. Their daughter went to the Tacoma Park Police with photographs of marijuana plants being grown in the basement. Um, Kitty Tucker complains of having severe migraines um, and fibromyalgia and uses the marijuana to treat her pain. Bob Alvarez had had a high level position with the Department of Energy uh, and lost his position um, on the basis of uh, this complaint. Um, the family's back together again. Uh, there have been reports in the newspaper of plea negotiations in which uh, both uh, Alvarez and Tucker will plea to one to misdemeanor count. Misdemeanor count. Um, but for a lot of people, I have to say, and maybe a lot of people in Tacoma Park especially, the specter of kids turning in their parents on a vice offense um, and one that might have been motivated in part by the government's war on drugs uh, brings to mind more a totalitarian culture than a democratic culture. Uh, how did you feel about having this case in your office at all? The totalitarian culture comes from the government and this was a girl who completely on her own thought what her parents were doing was wrong and she was right. But what about, and, what about the war on drugs as a motivator to that? And that's a government inspired... Uh, well, there, there is a war on drugs and that's a good thing. I mean, the war on drugs as defined by President Bush is not the war on drugs as I would like to see it have happened uh, in the future and in the past. The problem, what we think of as the war on drugs is the escalation of federal guidelines, sentences and so forth. What we have here is somebody, a child who, or a teenager who thinks what their parents were doing was wrong. And it was wrong. It was against the law. She turned them in, she did the right thing, and they were held accountable. We don't subscribe to the federal guidelines here in Montgomery County, so they're not going to be serving long jail terms, if any jail term at all. Um, but yes, they have a defense. Her defense was that she's doing it for medicinal purposes. That's something that would have gotten litigated had the case gone that direction. Instead, I think everyone resolved the case amicably. Um, we're not going to drop a case where somebody is distributing, has enough drugs to distribute They're drugs. asking that their records be expunged. Is that a possibility? That's something they'll have to seek from the court down the road. I mean, that's, um, you know, I don't view them or anybody else as deserving of special treatment. And we will treat them like we've treated everybody else. Um, if they, if people don't like the law and think that it's okay to grow that quantity of marijuana, then that's something for the legislature to address. We're here to enforce the laws, and we did. Is, is, is what they did the, the number one crime in America? No. We're looking for violent criminals. That's our top priority. Domestic violence, child abuse, elder abuse, and so forth. But when people are growing that quantity of marijuana in their home, they'll be arrested and they'll be prosecuted. Let's talk about community prosecution, which was the theme of your campaign for office. You've reorganized your office along those lines, essentially uh, putting, organizing the prosecutors, line prosecutors, on the basis of geography the five police districts in the county as opposed to on the basis of the crimes, a homicide, a misdemeanor, what have you. Um, last year, uh, when you were on the show, um, this was right before you took office, right after you won the election, um, I raised the issue of was there a danger with community prosecution perhaps breaking down the professional barrier that exists between prosecutors properly and police uh, and if police and prosecutors are placed into the same context, the cauldron all the time, won't prosecutors feel somehow obliged to uh, carry forward cases um, in order to stay in the good graces of the cops? Um, uh, and, uh, well, let's take a look at your response. Let's take a look. In terms of getting too close, the closer you can get, the better. 
if there are rogue police officers, and of course there are in any organization with a thousand officers, say, I happen to think that Montgomery County Police do an outstanding job, but there probably are, there are a few cops that, that have some problems. But by having community prosecution, you'll have the same prosecutors working with those officers, and those prosecutors will know who the, the bad officers are and be able to prosecute those officers accordingly if, if and when it becomes appropriate to do so. Uh, we've seen a lot of reports uh, since this interview of investigations into the Montgomery County Police Department, a large department, over a thousand people. Um, but uh, do you want to uh, confirm your remarks of the past or revise your comments, Counselor? I agree with every syllable I said, and I'm just glad I wasn't wearing the same tie last year <laughs> as this year. Um, we do have a phenomenal police department, and I've worked with a number of police departments. I've worked with a number of federal agencies in my career as a prosecutor, and we, bar none, this is just a phenomenal, phenomenal police department. And the reason why we have such a low crime rate here in Montgomery County is in large part due to the police. Like I said then, and like I'll say now, when you have over a thousand people, you're going to have some bad police officers. And I think our community prosecution efforts have helped us highlight some of those officers. We've been very hard on the police to make sure they tell us the few officers that have problems so that we are uh, careful and, and know whose testimony we're sponsoring in court and so forth. But I think the, the close relationship with the officers is a very, very positive thing. Um, as, as you and I were talking about before the show, there's a show called Law and Order, and that's precisely how it works. The police go out and find the bad guys, we prosecute them. We need to be working together. We need to make sure that the Constitution's followed. We need to make sure we're acting in a fair way, both from the police standpoint and our standpoint. But, um, Very quickly, because yeah. we're running out of time. Gun control. Uh, you sit on the governor's task force that is uh, supporting smart gun technology. Uh, and um, the attorney general of the state of Maryland uh, has come out in support of a handgun ban. Uh, what do you think about that? Uh, what should the state be doing at this point uh, in your office? Well, I pro before I came to, to this job, I was a prosecutor in Washington, D.C., where guns are illegal and handguns are illegal and it, it's certainly a, a favorable prosecution tool. Um, what we're trying to do in Maryland is promote responsible gun ownership and what we're doing is the task force which I'm the vice chair of is actually trying to make childproof guns and I don't think there's a strong lobby of people out there who think children ought to be shooting at each other or shooting themselves and what we've come up with is an intermediate, intermediate proposal where we have what are called integrated gun locks where you actually have to have a pin number to, to operate the gun and that I think will take away all the child deaths that we have by accident or otherwise in the future, they're looking toward higher technology, and, and whether we'll ever get to that point or not is something that remains to be seen. Yeah, we're not going to find out tonight because we've run out of time. Uh, thanks, Montgomery County State's Attorney Doug Gansler for joining me in the coffee house. Uh, good luck in year two of your uh, term. Thank you. Appreciate it. Still to come, talk show host Diane Rehm discusses her new memoir. Richie Haven sings Freedom, two views on pesticides and golf courses, and some cheery news on the culture front. They came to the MCI Center in the district for an announcement. And even without Juwan, Rod, and the Wizards, the news was a slam dunk to Montgomery County Executive Doug Duncan. The launching of an annual AFI Discovery Global Documentary Film Festival starting in the year 2001. To Duncan, the occasion marked another giant step in the transformation of Silver Spring into an urban arts and technology district. In Duncan's words, a content creation capital for the new economy. Uh, when you think back on where we were just five years ago and how bleak our prospects look, this is just tremendous news. And, and, you know, it's been, it's been one thing after another. Bolger Pratt coming in and creating the retail center with AFI coming in as part of that, with the Silver Theater, with Discovery saying, hey, we want to be near AFI. And now they formed a partnership to create the world's uh, biggest and best documentary festival. Uh, it's just tremendous news for Silver Spring. It really elevates Silver Spring to an even higher level. The redevelopment of downtown Silver Spring, I think, is one of the great stories in this country. And AFI has felt privileged to be part of that renaissance. When Discovery Communications <laughs> decided to build their headquarters across the street from the AFI Silver Theater, that's when we began to dream. In the coming millennium, the American Film Institute and Discovery will join forces to make the D.C. area the center for documentary excellence. 
AFI and Discovery will be neighbors in downtown Silver Spring, Maryland, helping to generate energy in one of the most vital communities in the greater Washington area and paving the way for one of the most exciting arts affiliations. An important ingredient of the rejuvenation right across the street from Discovery's future worldwide headquarters will be the renovation of the historic Silver Theater, a classic example of Art Deco architecture. Soon, the lights will dim, the projectors will roll, and the experience will enchant again. The curtain will rise on a new state-of-the-art facility, home to the stars, the storytellers, and an exciting new tradition. Two of the most respected names in film and video, the American Film Institute and Discovery Communications Incorporated are proudly partnering to celebrate and honor the world's best documentaries and their creators. Beginning in 2001 at the AFI Silver Theater, filmmakers from around the world will compete as they showcase their finest work at the AFI Discovery Global Documentary Festival setting the standard for documentary excellence. AFI will largely plan the festival's content, and Discovery Communications, Inc. will pick up much of the tab. You can be assured that Discovery's commitment is, is sufficient to make this a world-class festival. Discovery founder, chairman, and CEO John Hendricks applauded the efforts of his staff and that of AFI in dreaming up the festival, but he reserves special praise for someone else. Someone I, I consider uh, kind of the founder of all of the, these efforts uh, with the revitalization of Silver Spring, and that's its visionary, the county executive that we call Doug Duncan. Doug? It's very flattering. But I got to tell you what my wife told me this morning when she, she and I have been talking with this for a time, and she read the, the story and, and um, she said, this is tremendous news, it's wonderful, she's very excited about it. But she looked at me and she goes, just remember now, you wanted to put a wave pool in Silver Spring. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I don't know what the heck I was thinking of at the time. <laughs> thank God for the marketplace, which said this will never work. <laughs> The renovated Silver Theater promises to be at least as splashy as a wave pool. Three screens with seating capacities of 400, 200, and 85 respectively, and state-of-the-art equipment. The festival will feature documentaries produced in film, video, and digital formats. There will be screenings with the filmmakers present, retrospectives, focuses on particular countries and regions of the world, and competitions. I'm actually a long-term resident of Tacoma Park, and I know the area and love the area. And I think what's extraordinary is this whole Silver Spring, Tacoma Park, that whole region. These are people, in, in, in my memory, who were passionate about film, who were passionate about the arts, who were passionate about their community. What a great place to have a festival based. You know, I think that's just, it's the right place. You probably remember Snow Falling on Cedars from when it became a surprise bestseller book back in 1996. A gripping story of a death that might be murder, a trial that might be a miscarriage of justice, an interracial romance, an Anglo, a Japanese American during World War II, the worst time to fall in love like that. And the best part of the book was you got inside the characters and attention. You were solving a mystery where what was at stake was human rights in the most basic sense. No wonder it was a hit with all of our book clubs. You really wanted to talk to somebody after you'd read it. And now comes the movie, a holiday release. And it's a rare example of the movie you can like if you love the book, a family movie that's worth your family talking about. It's PG-13, by the way. It's also a rare case of using the best professionals Hollywood has to offer, including the brilliant editor, Hank Corwin, and they're finally in the service of a movie that's worth their talent. So you're watching a movie that has the production quality of a top flight feature with the sensibility of independent film. That's what you might expect from the director, an Australian named Scott Hicks, who made the acclaimed movie Shine. Carhina is dead. It's all over the island. You've been arrested. We have no answer. You sit there in silence. This trial is wrong. The whole thing is unfair. Maybe I should write an article about all the unfair things people do to each other. 
snow falling on cedars creates strong characters and perhaps more remarkably captures the complexity of the novel. The film also pays careful attention to period detail, especially on the Japanese internment. And you have to be awed by the combination of magnificent images and the sound, which is one of the most powerful actors in the film. All that state-of-the-art sophistication goes to tell a richly old-fashioned story about what truth is and how you get to it. How you get to it is you grow up. A boy grows to be a man in this story, and a society matures too. Here's my one complaint. Max von Sydow, who really is a grand old man, plays the accused man's lawyer. And he's given a character who's basically kind of a stretch Yoda. He has these lines that are very hard to say, like, accident rules every corner of the universe except maybe the chambers of the human heart. That's more than you want to see from one of your sacred images from film culture. Most of the time, though, the movie steers with dignity around triteness, and it leaves you, just as the book did, looking around for somebody to talk with about it. I hope that happens. Good luck, good viewing. Welcome to Writer's Block at the Coffee House. Today we're at WAMU-FM Radio, and my guest may be someone you're familiar with, Diane Rehm. Diane Rehm has written the memoir, Finding My Voice. She has hosted the Diane Rehm Show on WAMU-FM for 20 years. Her program is broadcast to 60 cities across the country as well as overseas, and she has been a correspondent for the PBS series Modern Maturity and host of AARP's Prime Time. She lives in Bethesda, Maryland. Welcome to the Coffee House. Diane, the radio has always been important to you. You talk about in your childhood the role it played. Would you say something about that? Well, you know, for me, who was born in 1936, there was no television. So I grew up listening to the Green Hornet, to the Shadow, yeah. the Lone Ranger. Um, I listened to the daily soap operas. I mean, it was just always such a part of my life and I loved it. And it was a comforting thing Absolutely, for you. especially uh, on Saturdays after I had finished all my housekeeping chores. Mm -hmm. um, at 10.30 on Saturday mornings came Let's Pretend. It was especially a comfort because there were long periods of time when out of anger, punishment, my mother just mm -hmm. didn't speak to me. Yeah. I mean, weeks would go by and she wouldn't speak to me. So the radio was a constant companion. So it's just crazy that I've ended it up is, in radio. It is, and yet it's not. It and sort yet of goes it's not. Along with the, That's right. Actually, I, this is a theme throughout the book, the theme of silence mm. this, and the painful silence that you later learned to not find so painful. It's the way that you do it is so amazing. Well, Lisa, for me, the amazing thing was everybody said to me after they read the book, was it cathartic? Mm -hmm. My response to that was that it was not so much cathartic as it was revelatory. Mm -hmm. I simply went upstairs to my sewing room and began writing. My husband, a lawyer, always starts with outlines, and he kept saying to me, you have to have an outline. I right, kept right. saying, I'm not good with outlines. <laughs> I just started writing, mm -hmm. and it was the silence in the house mm -hmm. that very day when he had left for Africa mm -hmm. that really sort of set the tone and allowed me to reveal to myself how much of an important role silence had played in my whole life. But also in terms of undoing the silence for you throughout your whole life, we need to talk a little bit about just how difficult it, things were for you as a child. Uh, the, the, the situation with the pain that you experienced with your mother, well, who I found extremely mysterious, by the way. She's, she's, she has th these moments of anger and violence and yet she's also, she has this allure to her, the gardening, the cooking, the No sewing. question, no question. Yeah. 
I have to confess that again, the book became revelatory. I think the more I wrote, having experienced that pain, having experienced the beatings, having experienced the cruelty, yes. and only fearing her, only knowing her through fear and silence, and yet on occasion listening to the radio cuddled up next to her. Yes. Um, I think I came to a greater understanding of her pain mm -hmm. and her depression and what she left behind. She left Alexandria, Egypt to come here to this country with my father. And she was quite young. Quite young. Yes. Her whole family left behind in Egypt. Mm -hmm. My father's whole family here in this country. She had no one yes. except for my father. She was beautiful. Mm -hmm. She wore clothes that were very different from those of my father's sisters. And I think they were jealous mm -hmm. of her. Mm -hmm. And I think her loneliness and her own disappointment Yes. At having left behind a man she loved, yes. having come across the ocean with my father, not to streets paved with gold, mm -hmm. but with a life that was, you know, sort of lower middle class. Mm -hmm. um, I think she was disappointed. I also think very often when there's a situation like that with a mother and daughters, the mother's looking at herself in her daughters. I think you're there's right. This, you know, I think this, you're right. So. And she, of course, herself had fair skin. Yes. She had dark hair. Here I come along. A blonde. Platinum blonde right. with these long sausage curls. Yes. And in the Arab community, it was quite unusual. Quite unusual. Mm -hmm. This is also a book about marriage. Would you please talk about silence in your marriage, filling the silence in your marriage. Okay. It almost at times made me feel as though I had married my mother yes. because John Ream is a person who withdraws. Mm -hmm. He is a person who dwells within himself far more yes. than I do. Yeah. I mean, I love to be with people. I love to talk with people. I love to engage. Yeah. Whereas John tends to be far more aloof and alone. Mm -hmm. When you're with him, I mean, he is the oh. most social, warm, yeah. graceful man. And yet, at the same time, when he was angry with me, he would withdrawal. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's his way. That's the way he does so it. So I, I found myself having to grope through that. Lots of therapy. Mm -hmm. You know, we are about to celebrate our 40th wedding anniversary. Yeah. And probably a good share of that 40 years has been spent in silence. Oh, oh yeah, I understand. Well, and this is what's so interesting about you professionally, because Again, you were like, no, no, <laughs> no, no, I'm not doing this. <laughs> this, right. is, this is just not nice for me. So this is what I'm going to do. And you started your career relatively late. I was 37. 37 yes. And uh, got into it totally by accident uh -huh. as a volunteer. And, you know, I had been on the stage acting from the time I was five mm -hmm. all the way through high school so that a microphone, a stage, speaking in front of people, expressing myself outside the home yes. was never a problem. Mm -hmm. So once I got into this radio studio, I mean, it was just, it felt as though I belonged and it felt as though you know, I could ask questions. Mm -hmm. I could have people respond to me. It was just thoroughly comfortable. Well, when you talk about finding your voice, you found yourself in finding your voice. It Absolutely. Like Absolutely. I also lost my voice in the process of yes. finding it yes. with something called spasmodic dysphonia 
that is being treated with periodic injections of botulinum toxin directly into the vocal cords that keeps them and me functioning mm -hmm. and I have to have them well it's been now almost four months since the last injection wow. which is the longest I've gotten so far. Oh I'm glad to hear that. Thank Sounds you. Sounds like things are, are improving. But you say in terms also of losing your voice towards the end of the book you say that you broke all these rules you were supposed to be quiet and instead you have a career in the radio you were supposed to be a housewife instead you became a professional and I was supposed to keep secrets yeah. and instead I told them all which, which is not only freeing but allows me to move forward let go of the past to forgive, to separate myself from that sadness and anger and hostility and just move on. Which is wonderful. Thank it's you. Wonderful. Thank you. But it's in the course of writing this book, I wanted to ask you just one thing about the process. Did you find that you had to read some of your passages aloud because so much of your your life has been you know, speaking. Hmm. So did it help you to read aloud or did you just straight write it out? I wrote. You know, at first they offered, Kanaf offered me a ghostwriter mm -hmm. and I said, nope, Good. if I am going to do a book, I'm gonna write it. The only thing I did do, Lisa, was to make sure my husband read every single page uh -huh. before I sent it off because in no way did I want to hurt or offend him. And he went along with every single, every single thing I said. Well, it's a feminist story. Uh -huh. And it shows that he's a feminist, too. Absolutely. You know? He's I mean, just it's wonderful. A, it's a, it, he is wonderful. I'm so impressed with so many of your anecdotes. Oh, thank um, you. Thank you. And also just the way that you tied all these pieces of your life together. In the way well, that I did. think that's also where a first-rate editor like Robert Gottlieb comes mm -hmm. into it in helping you put it together. Yes. Well, we're out of time. Thank you so much, Diane. Um, I really appreciate your doing. Oh, I loved it, Lisa. Good to talk with Good you. Good to talk with you, too. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks, Diane, for appearing at the Coffee House. Um, again, the book is Finding My Voice. This has been Writer's Block, and I'm Lisa Page. Still ahead, Richie Haven sings and remembers Woodstock 1. Hear why some folks are teed off about pesticides on golf courses, and we've got the top ten list for book sales and video rentals. But first... It will be in the season of the magnolias blossoming. The Messiah will wear a helmet and biker spandex when he arrives, holding in one hand photographs of someone's dead lovers, and cupped in the hollow of the other the foggy bellow of a French horn. Two cranes, destined for each other, will collide, then part. In a cafe on a side street, lovers will smoke cigars and eat black olives with onions. Women will seduce men by crying. And then, after one full year of light, followed by a hundred of darkness, a crescent moon will hang backwards in a night silent as the inside of a violin.
Hi, and welcome to Body and Soul at the Coffee House. One of my jobs as a teenager was planting the 18 greens of a golf course. Hard, painstaking work. Thousands and thousands of those tiny little sprigs dug in by hand. So it's absolutely understandable that the owners of a golf course do not want to repeat this process every year and must do their utmost to maintain their turf grasses. But does that give them license to use every pesticide, every fertilizer in the book? When does maintenance become indulgence? When does a golf course become a danger zone? Those are my questions, and here to give us the answers are Diane Cameron, Dick O'Connor, both with a lot of first-hand knowledge. Welcome to the coffee house, Diane, Dick. Um, I sort of set this up as a scare story, I guess. Uh, am, am I way off base here in that, Diane? Well, we do know that, in general, the problem of urban runoff from golf courses, suburban lawns, city streets, can be very poisonous and dangerous for, uh, for fish and for the insects that fish eat from the streams, and sometimes even to human health. Even uh, humans, even golfers, in other words. That's right. And uh, we also know that, uh, that golf courses do use, do tend to use insecticides and particularly herbicides to keep those, those tees and fairways green and uniform uh, at the same rate that, that heavy farm insecticide and herbicide use is, sometimes even at a higher rate. Uh, so we do know that golf courses can have very intensive pesticide use. That sometimes might go over the line. Yes. Okay. And, and Dick, you're, you yourself are a golfer. I used to be. <laughs> Had to give it up for other pursuits. Um, is your perspective the same here as Diane's? Well, I think that there's, there's been a concern among the uh, environmental community uh, about the use of herbicides, pesticides, and fungicides on golf courses. Uh, the golf course community is slowly starting to hear the message and is beginning to, to change uh, their methods and, 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 and also the perception of what they're doing. Uh, it's, it's taken about 10 years for the United States Golf Association to really move the, uh, the professional groundskeepers or superintendents more towards a methodology that is more environmentally sensitive uh, using a, uh, a methodology that will, will preserve sensitive areas but also reduce the amount of pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides. And also from an economic point of view, by reducing the amount of herbicides and, and pesticides, it's a cost savings to the, to the course and to the members who are the owners of these courses. So uh, from, from a good management point of view, it, uh, it makes sense. So what we're getting for this is, is green. Is the, the color green? Is that, do we get anything else for, <laughs> for putting pesticides? Well, in really, it's interesting. Uh, the USGA has had a green section of their turf management program uh, since about 1954. Uh, Within the past 10 years, the green section has moved more towards environmental management rather than just turf management, which was traditionally what are the best uh, turfs to use in different climates and different uh, soils. Uh, they have found that really the pesticide, herbicide, and fungicides that are used are not really used for the, to keep the grass green. It's to get the pests and to eliminate weeds and to eliminate a variety of different uh, nasties that are on the course, and, and as you probably know, Howard, from your early experience, uh, a green can cost anywhere from fifty to a hundred thousand right. dollars initially to to uh, put into existence. So members are very concerned when they start to see infestation of pests or or weeds that may in fact start to destroy that. And so the traditional method has been to try to use pesticides. Mm -hmm but we're finding that there are a whole series of other methods that they can use rather than using pesticides. They might be only able to use 10 percent pesticides, but they may be able to use enzymes, for instance, uh, to be able to uh, reduce the amount of uh, pests. Okay, Di Diane, are these reforms happening fast enough? If well, the, well, well, we'll grant Dick that they're happening, right? But uh, are they happening fast slowly. enough? Slowly. I think they're coming <laughs> slowly, but not as fast as I think a lot of us would like to see. Yes, that, I would agree with that, that there, the reforms are happening, but not fast enough. I, I'm a co-author of a, 
of a report that was published this year by the Natural Resources Defense Council. And the Fabulous. report is called Stormwater Strategies. <laughs> and putting in a plug for this. And if you Why log not? on to www.nrdc.org, you can, you can uh, both order a copy of this and also you can download uh, major sections of it. In this report, we have two case studies of golf courses that uh, both of which have taken environmental protection uh, to, to, to the ultimate level for a golf course, which in my view is that it, they mesh environmental protection with golfing. And in fact, the motto of one of these golf courses that we studied is, golf is good for the environment. Uh, one of them is in uh, Springfield, Tennessee, and the uh, golf course uh, manager there is uh, Wendell Nealon, and the designer, I believe, is Raymond Floyd. Um, and the very design of this golf course is environmentally sound, where uh, natural landscaping and buffer zones and many more trees are being used than for a typical course. And very similar for our other case study, which is in Glen, Glen Ellen, Illinois, and it's called the, uh, I believe that one is called the Legacy, designed by uh, designer David Gill. And again, the, where the very design of the golf course is more naturalistic, many more trees, more shrubs. Uh, I understand that that kind of design can make it a little more challenging for the golfer and might, the might better, impact the, better, the score. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's why you have pencil erasers on the tip of the pencil. That's, um, that's right. So we're yeah. looking for two things um, in the environmental movement. We are looking for uh, more green design of a course as the two that, that we've uh, studied here. And also uh, operation and maintenance, which Dick was talking about, uh, less pesticides um, during operation uh, and maintenance. Okay. Locally, rate the, the local golf courses. Are there some that are bad, uh, bad villains here? Are there some that are well, good well, guys? I, I'm familiar with, uh, with my local public course, Sligo Park Golf Course, uh, which is owned by uh, Montgomery County. And I spoke with uh, John Fink, the superintendent, who said that uh, he does not use insecticides. He occasionally uses herbicides, and those are selective, uh, as we call integrated pest management. Mm -hmm. right. um, but Dick? Dick uh, well, there are a number of courses that are beginning to move in, in, in the direction of uh, reduced pesticides. One that comes to mind is a case I was involved in and have been involved in. Um, the Chevy Chase Club recently just spent uh, about $6 million renovating their course. The course was closed for two years. Uh, they now have a beautiful facility, and I was talking with some of their grounds maintenance men, and they are, have dramatically reduced the pesticide herbicide uh, usage with a dramatic savings on a yearly basis. Uh, they are right now using an experimental enzyme program, which they are able to inject through the sprinkler systems. Uh, so thus we have reductions in the amount of spillage that's occurring there, uh, waste, uh, you have controlled applications. Uh, the the half-life of most of these uh, applications are now much lower than the, than the old days where it would sit there and maybe get into the groundwater. Uh, around the state, though, we've, we've seen emerging courses which are using good environmental management. If, if, let me just ask, if, if you're a golfer, just a duffer, uh, like me these days, what, what, do I watch for the signs? What, do I, what should I or should not do if I go out just to any old course and I don't know anything more than... I just show up. I would urge you to talk to the golf course superintendent for whichever course you're on and ask them, first of all, what do they use? What herbicides and insecticides? I would urge them, if they use any insecticides, to pull back from that. Look, consider uh, having a higher tolerance for insects, and especially if they're using diazinon. Um, I think diazinon is an insecticide whose Watch, watch out for that, the that, that, that we, yeah. we should look at banning that. Yeah. It's very toxic to stream okay. life, okay. And, and I think there's alternatives. Okay, and Dick? Well, like you ball. know, I've been playing golf for 40 <laughs> years, and I've been following my obsession for 40 <laughs> years. And, give, and give, give it to us in 10 seconds here, Dick. One of the things <laughs> is to watch for environmentally sensitive areas, and those are emerging on golf courses dramatically. Yeah. Okay, all right. So, and don't lick the balls. I think you said that. Don't lick the, the balls, balls to right. me before we got on. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Diane Cameron. Thank you, Dick Connor. I think it's safe to say that as much as we all love green grass, we value some other things even more. 
For body and soul, this is Howard Cohen. Next up, Richie Haven sings and talks up cultural literacy. Why literacy? Why is this so important to you? Well, because that's the biggest prisoner of all, I think. The prison, the, the gatekeeper. You know, if you don't know how to read, you can't get through a um, lot of gates. An awful lot of gates. Too many for you to even survive. So that's, that's why we are in, the way, in this world today. That's why we are the way we are. We have so much. But again, when we really inspect it, we have very little. So I feel that as much near past history as we can give them, including Woodstock, uh, the vibe, you know, in that sense, uh, to understand how that happened, that it wasn't a concert put together by a promoter in the same sense as they think of it today. They did put it together as a concert, only cost 15 bucks for three days, but at the same time, most of the people who came came for free. 
And uh, the real number was 850,000 people. And I think that that's what they really need to know, is that it wasn't all teenagers. It wasn't all, it was people of all ages. 20% were kids under 14 years old. So they need to know that it was a, it was not just a young thing as it was portrayed in the movie, uh, because they take their cues from those kinds of things. And if that's what they're left to believe, that's what's going to happen, mm -hmm. like the Woodstock of this year passed. That's what's going to happen if they're left to believe that this is all they have. You know, they have much more. Mm -hmm. And they have all of the talent, they have all of the heart, and they have all of the mind that we fought to get for ourselves. <laughs> they got it now. So it's their world and it's ours, and we can both do this together. That's, that's my, my, my thing. We yeah. can all do it together. <laughs> Every day that I wake, I must be mindful that every day is all I have to call my own. If every day the sun will rise, even though the dark clouds say so below, it will only tell the truth, we are alone. Every day that I believe, I must be mindful that every belief I have is all I own. Ten thousand roads will all return here, only reaping what they've sown. And it will only tell the truth, we are alone. We are all alone. Each one his own. We are all alone, together, we are not without what it's all about, we are all alone, with each other.
That's it for the December edition. See you next month, next year, next month. Quick, stop me in the coffee house. <laughs>